This is about the Radioactive Boy Scout. I'm going to do some demos, but these are video demos of things I've done in my backyard. So I don't have any radioactive material. Nothing's dangerous. Uh, nothing uh, is of any interest that somebody get hurt. Um, also, I'm going to give somebody a uh, prize for asking the best question. It's a uh, 1941 quarter. This is not just any quarter. It's a quarter that I re retrieved from my safe deposit box that was in the World Trade Center. And it's heavily heat damaged. And if you want to, after the question and answer, or during the question and answer session, I'm going to play a video of Mike actually going into one Chase Plaza, that is their basement, but all the um, um, safe deposit boxes were moved. And you'll actually see me open up my safety deposit box. Plus, you'll see the other safety deposit boxes there. Okay. One reason for doing this talk is that um, I know Homeland Security's idea of a dirty bomb. And I just thought that it was not the best optimized type of bomb. If the person was familiar with uh, playing with nuclear materials or a nuclear hacker, in, in quotes, uh, they could build something more capable and more lethal. And also, at times, I thought that maybe Homeland Security's model desert bomb, maybe that was disinformation, so that people would try to go about constructing something that was not very useful. Okay. Radiation. Uh, the most basic thing that uh, somebody's going to look for is uh, gamma rays. Most people who have um, some type of radiation detector, the 99% of the time, it's going to be looking for gamma rays. The two sources, one second. For a dirty bomb, the two most likely sources are cesium-137 or cobalt-60, basically orphan type of um, nodules where the, the, these materials are sealed in with uh, a stainless steel, some type of stainless steel housing. And um, these isotopes are used in a lot of well logging equipment, other industrial uses, thickness gauges. And throughout the world, there are a lot of these orphan resources or orphan radioactive things that have just fallen into uh, junkyards or wherever. Neutrons. A neutron has no charge. It's produced by a reactor. And if you bombard something with neutrons, you make them radioactive. They become an isotope of their own self. Radiation, alpha particles and beta particles. Alpha particles are helium nuclei that has a plus two charge. Beta particles are electrons, minus one charge. Basically, these uh, particles don't travel in any great distance. They're only dangerous if you either ingest it or inhale it, and it stays in your lungs or in your body. Uh, these are attacks in the past that have uh, utilized some type of chemical means. Uh, the re Russian in um, London who was poisoned with plutonium-210, he ate it. Um, he was given a very massive dose. Uh, plutonium-210 produces alpha particles. And again, he was given a massive dose. And I guess the reason for the massive dose it was to send a message to people. In 1984, the followers of Bhagwan, this was in Antelope County, Oregon, uh, poisoned the uh, salad bars at a number of restaurants. What they did is they sprayed uh, salmonella into the salad bars. If you wanted to poison using, let's say, alpha, some type of a nuclei which produce beta particles, alpha particles, you could almost use the same technique. In 1966, the CIA and the Department of Defense uh, sprayed harmless substances on the tracks in the subway system just to see how far they would carry. These are supposedly um, harmless uh, bacteria that they could uh, track. In the subway system, I live in New York City. I work in New York City, take the subway every day. Um, you notice that particles, any type of particles can travel great distances just from the trains moving them. Uh, passive detectors. Geiger counter, iron chamber survey, gamma simulation detector. Passive detectors are probably the most common type detectors. Um, and again, sure, let me just, this is a passive, this is a Geiger counter. Uh, this Geiger counter was actually made in the Ukraine, Soviet Union, uh, where they have Chernobyl. The people there need an industrial strength Geiger counter. Active detectors. Active detectors illuminate objects with either neutrons or gamma rays. And certain materials that will be of nuclear interest will actually form a stream of neutrons from being illuminated. Or 
radiographically, they would show up. Okay. Right now, I'm going to run a video, video demo, and hopefully everything works. Okay, this is the first, this is the first video demo. That's an old-fashioned 1964 civil defense Geiger counter. The other side, you see this little yellow thing, which is also a Geiger counter, and this is much more sensitive. And what I'm going to do is that's a probe that's sensitive to gamma rays. I'm going to open up the probe, and the probe will also be sensitive to beta particles, beta rays. And on these old-fashioned type of... Can everybody hear the counting? Okay, good. On these old-fashioned probes, they sort of have a check source on the side, which... Uh, is a beta source. Now that I close the probe, it's not really picking up anything. The other Geiger counter has a window in the back of it that you can pull off, and it'll be uh, sensitive to beta particles. This uh, Geiger counter also has an alarm when you go over 0 0.30 microsevs, which I guess in the Russian Federation is the highest level of contamination you can have in a residential house. It, uh, it uh, tells you that by run going, it tells you that by the alarm going off. This, by the way, on the internet is about 150, maybe $200, and it's probably one of the better type of a detectors for personal use. Right now, I'm pulling out a check source. It's cesium-137, and it's right now against this one, and you hear the alarm going off. And I'll, I'll also have a close-up of it. And it is pretty hot. One other thing that's happening is um, we'll have to turn it down. I'm detecting both the gamma rays from the cesium and the beta particles from the cesium with the probe open. One other thing that um, is part, hard to notice is that Geiger counters generally pick up um, they're designed for low-level radiation, and they can saturate. If the radioactive source is that hot, they can saturate, and after they, the needle pins, it could go back and forth or fluctuate. And it doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's safe. It means it's, uh, you should get out of there. And I have a close-up of that, that uh, source, that cesium-137. It's five microcuries of cesium-137. If that source was ten, more than 10 microcuries, I need a license to have it, but it's only five microcuries, and uh, these sources are available from, this one came from Spectron Techniques, but the sources are available from a number of different uh, nuclear laboratories. Right now, I have two uh, minerals of uranium. I have a green mineral on the right. Is that your one? Well, I have a green mineral. It's torbonite, and radioactively, it's pretty hot. Then I have another one, which is sort of brownish, smaller one, that's beta -fied. It's not really that hot radioactively. And they, yeah, there's the alarm. Yeah, I'm opening up the probe now. So go, 
takes over the gamma rays or the beta. Yeah, the beta fight is much less radioactive. The green torbonite is about 35,000 counts per minute if you hold the probe right next to it. The beta fight is about two or 3,000 counts per minute. It's really not, in the, even though one uh, mineral seems to be physically a lot larger than the other one, it's not related to the mineral size. I'm going to do one more. This is the uh, 1964 Civil Defense Geiger counter, and I have it on top of a lead sheet. The sheet's about an eighth of an inch thick to show uh, the, just the effect of uh, shielding. And this is unshielding get from gamma rays. If it's neutrons, I would use a different, I would use something with um, a material composed of like hydrogen. But this shows one of the effects of shielding. That's again the uh, small Geiger counter, which just showed the background reading in my backyard. The radioactive Boy Scout, his name was David Hahn. He lived in a um, suburb of Detroit. He's a Boy Scout. He wanted to earn his Atomic Energy Merit Badge. Um, he was a great social engineer. He called himself Professor Hahn, and he wrote away to a number of different uh, societies and groups to obtain information. Uh, he wrote away to the Czech Republic samples of u uranite and pitch blend. He said he was a professor, physics instructor. He conned some government officials. He received a reply from one out of every five letters. Uh, he's about uh, 16, 17. Um, 94, 95. He also learned from government sources that beryllium produces neutrons. Uh, it produces neutrons if you bombard it with alpha particles. Also, if you bombard it with uh, gamma rays, it produces some neutrons too. Okay. He had um, a number of chemistry books. He did a lot of experimentation in his backyard and in his shed. He had the Golden Book of Chemistry, and he got a great many experiments from that. He developed his own gunpowder, nitric acid, and yellow cake. Yellow cake is the first type of refinement. If you get uranium ore and you pulverize it and mix it with a number of chemicals to precipitate out the uranium, you end up producing yellow cake. So that's the first type of ore type of um, product that you receive. And it's also something that you would really consider toxic or an EPA type of a problem, somebody producing yellow cake. Right now, there are a lot of people in the country doing that, producing yellow cake. But the, nobody knows where they are or who's doing it. The only reason why I know are just questions that are answered on forums or questions asked on forms that deal with radioactivity. So you can sort of sniff out and figure out what different people are doing. He wanted to build a breeder type reactor, something that would solve the energy crisis. And um, he's a very persistent type, persistent person. Hold on. He wanted to uh, obtain um, uranium-235, which is fissionable or whatever he could uh, obtain. And he found that uranium-235 or plutonium was hard to obtain, but thorium 
uh, and thorium from lantern models, the old type of lantern models, was somewhat easy to obtain. And he got copious amounts of mantles. The, one of the first things that he was working on is the neutron gun. A neutron gun basically is a type of device that produces neutrons and it can transmute, um, not transmute elements, but make elements radioactive. So when you increase the number of neutrons in the nucleus, it's the same, it's the same element, but it's radioactive. It's not as stable. Um, one of his sources for um, neutrons, or one of his sources for alpha particles to use to bombard uh, beryllium and aluminum with was the um, uh, mercurium-241. Uh, That's found in the, um, smoke detectors. And it's just like a little button source. I should have brought a picture of it, but I forgot. Uh, he calculated that he needs at least 100 detectors to produce a um, large enough stream of alpha particles to produce neutrons. He also was able to come across a large stash of radium. And radium, you don't see that around anymore to um, uh, radium dials for instruments that are used in the dark or airplane instruments in the dark or watches because it is radioactive and potentially toxic. He was able to come across a, a um, uh, what do you call those places, a, um, a shop that dealt in older uh, furniture, clocks, things. I'm going to say an artifact shop. I guess an antique shop, sorry. An antique shop. And um, he was able to find a clock that had a vial, uh, I think a quarter ounce of vial of radium in it. It was contained in it. The people or the women who originally painted the dials apparently left them in there. And the way he was actually able to locate that is he was driving by at the shop with his uh, the Geiger counter on his dashboard and it started clicking very vigorously and he wanted to see where that was coming from. So it was sort of very fortuitous. Now, he had great perseverance, it's incredible. Okay, so he wanted to build his re breeder reactor and he has now his reactor startup. His neutron gum becomes the core of the reactor and he has tiny foil wrapped cubes containing thorium. He also has cubes containing carbon, using the carbon to slow down the, um, the neutrons so that they'd be captured by the thorium uh, nuclei. The outer layers of the thorium, of the box, will also contain thorium. And the shoebox size device was about 4,500 grams. It was about a little over two pounds. Um, he didn't make any uh, type of uh, presentation or made any type of a um, thought that maybe things get out of hand. How do I shut this down? Today, all reactors that you can see that are built, they have control rods, which can basically turn the reaction off or on by pulling the control rods out or putting the control rods in. He had nothing like that at all. His reactor was getting more and more radioactive by the day, and he started detecting radiation from five houses down. And basically, he got scared, and he took it apart and put some of the pieces in his trunk and the toolbox, and other pieces he hid around the basement of the house and in his shed. And um, I'm not sure why he had that thought to do that. Anecdotally, from what I've gotten from the internet, from forums, when people have a problem, they've been doing something with uh, radioactive minerals and things seem to get hot and they sort of panic, what they tend to do is take everything put together and then bury it in some type of park somewhere around. Not in their backyard, but some type of park. Um, there's some, one interesting aspect about David's uranium engine um, and it's that the Nazis were also experimenting during World War II with uranium engines or reactor type devices. And if you look in the two books, The Virus House, which relates to Nazi um, work with radioactive materials, and Hitler's Uranium Club, you see some parallels between the work 
that he did and um, where the Nazi scientists were going. Also, if you look at some of the resources, you realize that the Nazis were also trying to produce some type of a dirty bomb, something that they could drop where it would perform, it would just be a type of cancer um, type device, something that would produce cancers. What I think today, I think, um, again, he was a hobbyist. I don't think he's doing anything now. I did try to contact him a number of times with telephone and email, and I got no response. I don't even know if I got the right person. I think worldwide there's probably three to five people who have some type of reactor type device that they have running. It's something that produces neutrons, something that is getting hotter radioactively day by day. Um, it's not a real reactor. It's more of a public health product or public health concern than something that being a terrorist type concern. Um, I think today you could build something like what he built, but then you can make tremendous improvements in the design. What we don't know, we don't know the neutron flux of his device. We don't know any of the gamma ray values. All of his notebooks he burned. He was afraid when he took everything apart that maybe he had a real problem there. Maybe the authorities were coming after him. He just burned everything and tried to eliminate any type of tracks. Uh, the EPA, or the Michigan EPA, eventually cleaned up the site. And um, what happened is he packed up the red toolbox in his trunk of his car. And the day after that, he was in some type of a neighborhood at around 2 a.m. And the police were investigating the break-ins that they had in the neighborhood. And they asked him what he was doing, and he didn't, he didn't give the police a good answer. So the police ch checked his car. They checked the trunk, and they saw a lot of strange things in the trunk. And they asked him about the red toolbox. And he said, well, don't touch it. It's radioactive. <laughs> hey. So, which is not the right response. But this was 1994, 95. That was an era when people were not sensitive about these things. So they arrested him. They put him in the police station. Uh, they towed his car to police headquarters. Uh, they were potentially afraid that maybe he had a atomic bomb, which why would you tow to police headquarters? You, why don't you tow it to a, um, a pistol range, a rifle range someplace? And they got other people, other authorities, including the EPA, the NRC, other authorities to take a look, at, look into this matter. And ultimately, David wasn't arrested but uh, they did go back and forth with his parents a number of times. Of course, today, if you do this, I think you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Did he get the merit badge? Yes, he did. He got the merit badge, although the, although the Boy Scouts were at first, when all this information broke, the Boy Scouts were a little bit re re hesitant about giving him the merit badge, but he certainly exceeded the boundaries of any scout with an atomic energy badge. Now going to a homeland security model of what they think about the dirty bomb. And they think these orphan sources of cobalt 60, cesium-137, uh, basically somebody would blow them up with a high explosive like TNT. Um, and when they say high explosive, they're talking about uh, uh, TNT or something along the f same lines like C4. Um, it's just as easy as this source may be propelled by the explosion as that it be broken apart. Uh, I've always thought maybe this was disinformation because if you have a radioactive source, for the, you can do other things with it. And one of the things is that you could use it as a um, seed corn. Basically, you can make other things radioactive. If you make other things radioactive, you don't have one dirty bomb, you potentially have many and you can build money. Okay, seed corn to make other things radioactive. What would you pick? Well, you're probably better off going with nano size materials. A nano size material is very, very small. Uh, it gives you, right here I have what human hair is in nanometers, um, red blood cells in nanometers. These nanotype particles pass through a HEPA filter. A HEPA filter is a high-efficiency filter that originally was designed 
during the Manhattan Project when they were developing atomic bombs. It will pass through also just about any other type of filter, including filter paper that some um, devices use to sample air. They sample air and then they collect the residue in the filter paper and test what it is. Also, when you have nano-sized particles, you have an inner compound can be toxic at the nano-sized level because not only if you inhale it, it will pass through cell walls and potentially irritate cells. Okay, build a perfect dirty bomb, a nano-sized material. The NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, has a, a um, program on their website called the Toolbox. The Toolbox shows what different uh, isotopes or different materials. They're alpha particles, beta particles, the energy that they release, and also the um, potential biological hazard of these materials. Um, this is something that, this is almost a dual nature type of device that you could use it if you're at a reactor site to see if somebody was exposed to compounds, how much potential problems they'll have in the future, but you could also use it as a designer type things for specialized designer isotopes to infect people or radiate people. And um, again, you could make multiple bombs of different sizes. Nano size can be passed just by the air or the subway system. It can be passed by just trains passing. If you want to pass it, otherwise you could use some of the symbols black powder, which is readily available. Okay, next thing. If you do have multiple dirty bombs, and um, I live in New York City, I take New York City subway every day, I um, work in New York City, um, and this is what I thought somebody would use as strategic targets. The fire department, hazmat trucks, the decon shower trucks, these are all fire department equipment, hazmat one, and this equipment is known by a uh, number of hobbyists, fire department hobbyists, they know where the equipment is located. So the hip equipment is not hidden, but again, somebody tried to use it as strategic targets. The NYPD also has a hazmat truck at the um, base at Floyd Bennett Field, which is probably harder to get to. I'm going to talk about radiation alarms. What can set off a radiation alarm? Uh, obviously, uranium minerals, radiologic procedures. If you had a spec scan or PET scan, you're injected with uh, radiological isotopes, uh, radioactive drugs, radio seeds. And that's for a human being. Interesting thing happened to me coming home from work. My radiation detector in New York City subway goes off and I'm above the ground. I call 911, I give them all the information, and I found that it was actually seed across from me that was radioactive. I give them all the information, include my cell phone number, I expect some type of call back. So this was a Friday. And I even remember the subway car that it was in. It's 5333. Okay. I get no, nothing back from the NYPD, so I'm just curious. Um, the next day, I call New York City Information Hotline, a general hotline where any general information that you need, uh, you can receive, get from them. And the operator did not know what the word radiation meant. And this is just incredible. So that was, sun, that was Saturday. Sunday, I called the NYPD, the, the terrorist hotline. I gave them all the information. And they asked me what type of detector. I told them it was an eco-test. They asked the, the, um, the serial number. I gave them the serial number. Then they asked a bunch of other questions. And I told them that I felt very likely it was somebody who had some type of a, a radiological procedure because the seat was uh, from back top to bottom is radioactive. And again, this is... Uh, they picked up a number of people who had this procedure before, that, meaning the NYPD. And they didn't realize it at the time, but these people were radioactive because of the procedure. Okay. okay. What they didn't ask me on the terrorist hotline, well, first thing, they didn't ask me if the detector saturated. That would mean that it's a very, very high radiation limit. They didn't ask me what the highest reading that I obtained either. And... Um, and that I was very, thought was very strange. They also then asked me if I received the, the um, readings and the, from any foodstuffs that were nearby. 
or if any foodstuffs were located. Something else that I've seen in the past 22 months, and I can't understand it, all of the hot uranium minerals that used to be on the Internet and other source, private sources have disappeared. And I don't know why that's happened, that all of a sudden they're gone. And other people that I asked who had minerals or had interests, nobody had an explanation for it. I mean, I have no explanation. I thought at first maybe Homeland Security, for some reason, was trying to get them off the market. But this is countrywide or worldwide, and I have no idea. And if anybody has an idea, uh, you can let me, let me know. Next slide. The government, after 9-11 in the World Trade Center, the government basically had a disinformation type of, um, of uh, I don't know if you call it their policy, but it was a policy that the World Trade Center was safe to go back to, that the hazmat workers and the other workers can work there without any type of uh, negative health aspects. Uh, the government says it's safe, but what happens if a very media savvy, savvy terrorist says it isn't? What happens if they, somebody launches some type of an attack where it may be difficult to obtain information that there was an attack and uh, has a disinformation type, um, well, basically a disinformation type of um, policy? And one last time, uh, one last slide. If high fidelity terrorists, the Homeland Security has this 10 kiloton bomb, that, uh, hypothetical bomb that terrorists could set off. Hypothetically, if they did have this type of bomb, what they probably would do is salt it. And by salting it, they put in cobalt or cesium or zinc where they have a much longer half-life and that the area would remain radioactive much longer and um, you know, people would not be able to uh, return to that area. Also, you know, these would be picked up by the air, and the people downward would have a high incidence of cancer. And I forgot something else. I forgot something. I had one other, one other demo, and let me just, this is the last. This is the background radiation in my backyard, 0 0.08, 0 0.09. says I'm taking the back off of the um, detector. So I can also, not only gamma rays, I can also uh, record uh, beta particles. This is a lead pig, which uh, you keep like radioactive uh, materials in, uh, low-level radioactive materials, maybe check sources, um, probably some minerals. And I'm taking a bolt out of there. I'm not using forceps because this is radioactively hot. I'm using forceps because I have fat fingers and I can't really grab the um, bolt with my fingers. And this was a steel bolt. And what I did is, in that pig, I have an alpha source, an alpha particle source, and then I have aluminum foil over it, and a, a, a basically a small pebble of beryllium. So I'm getting um, neutrons in there and making this uh, bolt radioactive. When I'm probably producing um, iron-55, which is also a heavy beta emitter, and that's one of the reasons for being taken off the back. It has one side that's more, I'm sorry, one, one side that's more radioactive than the other side. So now it's over the limit. It's over the limit for the Soviet Republic to ha have in your residence. 
Actually, there's a side of it that's actually much more radioactive than that, but this is just like a, a demonstration. Everybody can tell I, I live near an airport. Now I'm taking this apart. That's a little piece of carbon. I have a little washer in there. That's my pellet of beryllium. That's a little foil. And those are the old Coleman lanterns that had contained thorium. So it's an alpha emitter. And um, this is more proof of concept that you can make things radioactive. The alpha particles hit the aluminum and beryllium and uh, release neutrons. I don't know, any questions? Granite, all granite is radioactive. It contains um, a certain amount of uranium. Uranium is not an uncommon mineral. And if you go into Manhattan, which is part of Manhattan is radioactive, uh, not radioactive, but there is granite in Manhattan, uh, you'll pick up readings. I had, another, I had another video or demo that I was going to do. My father just had granite steps put in on his porch. And I went out to there, and it was pretty hot. It was like, it should have been 0 0.08 on this uh, detector as like 0 0.20. A lot of people getting granite uh, or more granite type of uh, tabletops or granite type of kitchen areas. Yes? I read about them about four or five years ago and I was just uh, sort of amazed and then um, you know I, I just um, I was also interested in radioactive minerals and collecting them and it came up on some forums. Yeah. You handle it for a short period of time. It's probably better. Like the green mineral that you saw, torbonite, is very hot. And also the flakes, the crystals there on the surface are very soft. There's as soft as uh, my uh, nail. So it's usually better to handle it with gloves. But, you know, wash your hands. Don't... Uh, do it after you eat. Don't have to go and play with them and then eat later on. That's yes, Actually, I have a number of questions. Okay. Number one, do you turn off the lights so you can glow in the dark? No, I don't glow, I don't glow in the dark. Uh, number two, your, your, uh, your idea of uh, irradiating uh, things in, in the 100 nanometer range or less? Yes. Yeah, you could, um, you know, you could easily infect the subway system with it and just spraying the uh, materials out because just by walking on it, you're going to put it, make it mobile in the air. And also the air currents, because it's so small, just air currents themselves will transport it. Also, there's not a type of method to remediate picking up nano-sized materials in a large area, like not in the subway system, but in... Uh, uh, Grand Central Station or Penn Station, and a transportation hub. There are more and more companies every day selling them. It's not as difficult now as it once was. I'm talking about, let's say, iron or cobalt as a nano size type of uh, product. Go ahead, sorry. I think lead is still the best that they use. Um, I think what some places, what they do is they just seal it. But, they, but uh, lead is like the best. 
um, radiation uh, defense against gamma rays. Neutrons, it's something different. Right. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry, go ahead. Excuse me? Um, is turn off radiation when you see a glow, a bluish glow? Okay, no. I mean, you'd have to go to something that came out of a reactor for that. Sorry. Um, I really don't know. The Nazis built similar devices that, was, that were enclosed, and some of them uh, blew up or, or caught fire. Um, you know, he would have had a big public health issue. Um, he was in, like, uncharted territory, and um, I don't think uh, the NRC or any public officials think that people actually are nuclear hobbyists building these type of devices or having them playing with, right? Yeah, yeah they're wrong. Sorry. No, I, I read the story. Um, and it was, in, I think, an apartment building. They still on smoke detectors. I guess he was re trying to relive his glory days. I, I don't know. I tried to contact them. I tried to with phone, email, and uh, I can't get a hold of him. Maybe he had a lot of people just for cranks trying to contact him, but um, I don't know. The radiation. Well, thorium is toxic. And he dealt with a lot of toxic materials, and he was heavily exposed there for a number of years. Also, the particle, he did use a mask when he tried to do these things, but some of these particles are very small, so you don't know what's in his body. Yeah. Is uranium hexafluoride is, is used when they want to separate U-235 from U-238 in a... Um, in a uh, centrifuge. I thought anything with fluorium or compound of fluorium is very dangerous because fluorium is the most reactive of the elements. I don't know if uranium fluoride, hexafluoride is dangerous because um, the only people who have access to it are government people or people in specialized labs. So I wouldn't want to be around it. If it's highly corrosive, it's corrosive to you. But yeah. Um, one other thing, the, the bolt that I made radioactive, um, you could touch it, feel it, and everything else. It's not a problem. If I ground it very, very, very fine and somebody ingested it or somebody inhaled it in their lungs, potentially that iron would leach out into your bloodstream and it would combine with um, the hemoglobin in your blood and also go, reside in the bone marrow. Potentially it would be a cancer source. If it was a nanotype material, it'd be much worse because, again, there's no remediation today. If somebody inhaled nano-sized materials and you try to remove from their body, the best analog to use nanotype materials as a destructive force is the um, depleted uranium that they used in the first Gulf War. And you had some portion of the spectrum of materials, actually the nano uranium nano-sized range and the soldiers inhaled. Yes? Could you speak up? I'm sorry. Yes. I thought it was a person who had a medical procedure. Then I realized I never checked underneath the seat. I should have checked underneath the seat, which I didn't. I was excited. Yes, yes. No, you're right about that, and I could have um, overlooked looking under the seat um, because 
I thought maybe well his sweat had some radioactive. It was pretty hot. That scene was actually pretty hot. Um, I screwed up. I mean, I could have really. What happened is, I was two stops away from my stop. I was sleeping on the subway, which is normal. People do that. And normally, if you have a 20 minute stop away, 40 minute stop away, uh, you could just get up for the stop. I got up and I thought, my God, somebody's cell phone, stupid idiot, cell phone's going off. I didn't realize it was my detector. And I got excited. I actually found something radioactive. And actually, they probably thought I was crazy on the subway because I was standing up and going like this to try to figure out where it was and there's a seat across from me. So, you know, I screwed up. I didn't find it. I'm sorry, go ahead. I know people, and by the way, I contacted the New York City Police Department and New York City Office of Emergency Management about this talk, and they expressed absolutely no interest at all in coming to this talk. And uh, do I feel, I don't think that um, what they're doing, I guess they're doing the best they can, the New York City Police Department. I guess they listen to Homeland Security, which, I don't know. I mean, I could think I could make a much more lethal dirty bomb than they could, they could ever come up with. But, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I don't know because I only had about six or seven months. It's on all the time, by the way. And I, if I had a radioactive source, I could show you that it would go off. So this basically is a dosometer too. It could sum over a number of hours or days my radiation exposure. But it's also an instantaneous reading type guy. Geiger counter. Um, what was I going to say? I'm sorry, yes. Really? Yeah. I mean, somebody could try using it that way. Um, uh, I don't think the Department of Homeland Security is that very creative in thinking about how uh, to build things. Um, let me just give you a perspective. Somebody who's a hacker utilizes the materials that they have at hand. And usually you don't have a lot of money, so you have to be very resourceful. Like this kid, David Hahn, was very resourceful. If you're a government bureaucrat working for the Department of Homeland Security, you have a big budget. You don't have to think about how to make things work for the smallest amount of money. You don't think of all the possible materials to use. Uh, you certainly wouldn't think that, hey, if somebody rated nanotype materials and deposited in the New York City subway system or Penn State, Penn Square, Penn Station, or Grand Central Station. How would I detect it? How would things happen? Which would be very difficult to detect. Yes, yes. I don't have a great deal of faith that they're doing the best. I think they're doing the best they can, but I don't think they're as creative to understand what is doable. I mean, they did not realize what was doable when the David Hahn put his thing together. I'm sorry. Uh, you um, I'm a data security analyst where I work. You know, I've always been interested in science, um, hacking. I was always used to go to 2,600 meetings. I did publish uh, a, an exploit against war dialers, which is about over more than 10 years ago, much more 10 years ago. I'm a survivor of 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, which, um, from my experience, hold on a second. From my experience, people thinking that they could bomb the, the stock exchange and cause it to shut down, uh, that's not going to be the case. Because in 93, what I did is I was located to another building. I created a bunch of mainframe IDs for people. And they ended up transmitting files back and forth through the mainframe into the lands. Uh, you know, we had, you know, you could use a binary transfer, other transfers, so that was successful. My cousin on 9 11 died. He was New York City Fire Department captain. He was possibly promoted to bat battalion chief. Um, 
I had my coin collection in a safe deposit box in the World Trade Center. And um, I don't know, why, why don't I run that film here? My actual recovery of, uh, that's from the World Trade Center, we run it here. I don't see, there's no talks after me, so. That sounds like a good idea? And I'll, I'll, still, I'll still answer questions. Oh. It is being used. Okay. So unfortunately, the room is being used. Um, I'll tell you, if you want to ask more questions, ask more questions, and then when I have to leave, I'll leave. And um, I'll just give you a little taste of what the, that. Um, they give me a Q and A room. Actually. I guess, say what, why don't I move over to the Q&A room? So anybody wants to ask more questions, anybody wants to uh, see that film or that DVD of my recovery, yes? Yeah. The question, let me just read, the question was why should I think the Department of Homeland Security is doing the best they can? And, and I, have an e I have a very easy answer for that, and you're not going to like the answer. The answer is I'm a coward, and the government seems to go after people who make waves. Uh, the government seems to have picked a number of people, like in the anthrax, this Dr. Hatfield, this other guy. Then there was this professor up in New York State who was a... Professor of Art, and he used uh, bacteria cultures as a form of autistic expression, and the government investigated him, the FBI, for a number of times. So I'm a coward. No, no, I'll tell you the reason why. Um, I'm fighting. I have other reasons. I'm 54 years old, so I work at a place where you don't have young people, the old people. Um, I survive of cancer. I have an autistic son. So um, I'm a coward. I just got to... You know, if they say, uh, I'm, I'm serious. So, tell you what, I'll shut this down. We'll go across. I'll play the, the film of my recovery. And if you want, if we only have a couple of people pass around the quarter. It's that um, they don't really have any creativity. They don't know how to build things on a small. And they don't, they seem to think the government sees in their big picture the people that they're going to catch are very, very stupid. And so far, the people that they did catch and went to trial were very, very stupid. I mean, they couldn't, honestly, the people that they caught, they, have, they couldn't make a good cup of instant coffee, yet alone run a cappuccino machine. Thank you.